dragons, majestic, awe-inspiring creatures whose images enchant and fascinate people all over the world. He could even devote an entire video to the importance of dragons in modern culture and the world epic. Without this image, the modern world would be incomplete, deprived of something truly beautiful. Movies and books, paintings and music, computer games. Dragons have taken up residence in all forms of modern art. They're incredible. They make everything better. And thank the gods, the witch universe is not left without these stunning creatures. Yes, today we're gonna talk about dragons. We will go all the way to the formation of the image of dragons, from ancient myths to modern books and computer games, to the universe of the Witcher. The path is long and winding, the path that goes around the globe and allows you to draw something from the peoples, the path of a truly great creature. Before we start this video, however, we would like to thank our patrons, whose support motivates us to make more videos on the Witcher universe on the channel. Do join their ranks, and we promise more interesting content in return. But in any case, Get yourself a snack for now, because the old witcher has prepared for you a complete dragon bestiary issue. From real mythology all the way to the witcher universe, from the ancient world to our reality, this is the way of the dragon. Dragons of the Ancient Times It is impossible to imagine our world without the image of a dragon. It adorns and complements myths, legends and tales of people all around the world. Dragons are carried through millennia, and people only describe their endless journey. The image of dragons originated in the ancient world, in the legends of the first great states. It spread with amazing speed, and scientists still find it difficult to unequivocally answer the question, how did it happen that the image of the dragon appeared and took root almost all over the globe? Almost all mythological monsters are unique to a particular culture or region, but not dragons. For the first time, tales of dragon-like creatures are found in ancient Egypt, a serpent named Apop, often called Apophis in our time, stands out. According to legends, he fights the sun god Ra every night. When at night Ra begins to sail the underground waters of Nile, Apop, aiming to destroy him, drinks all the water from the river. In the battle with Apop, which is repeated every night, Ra emerges victorious and forces him to spew the water back up. So Ra continues his journey and eventually a new day begins. Apop is the eternal enemy of the god Ra, he tries to swallow the sun and deprive the world of the sunlight forever. The serpent is huge and extremely powerful. Only divine power helps Ra win this battle. Apop lives in the underworld. He is the personification of the evil force, whose goal is to enthrone the night over the earth. If the prototype of a huge evil serpent was given to us by the Egyptians, then for the first time the possibility of such a serpent to transform into a humanoid creature was described by the inhabitants of ancient Mesopotamia. In their tales was the goddess Tiamat. She personified the primordial salt ocean from which everything in the world emerged. She was depicted as a dragon or a hydra with seven heads. At the same time, in the Babylonian cosmogonic myth Enuma Elish, Tiamat was described as a woman. She was the primordial god, the foremother of all living things. But she was defeated by the younger god Marduk, who was not afraid of either Tiamat's strength or army. Interestingly, Tiamat's army also consisted of dragons. Marduk defeated Tiamat, and from her body parts he created the world. From one half of her body, the sky, from the other, the earth. From Tiamat's head he created a great mountain, and from her eyes two rivers flowed out, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Tiamat's chest became a chain of hills, and her tail, which was in the form of a dragon, became a barrier to fresh water. Dragons of Antiquity and the Middle Ages Although the image of a huge serpent came to us from ancient times, it received its name from antiquity. It was in the language of the ancient Greeks that the word dragon appeared. It came from the verb to see, or from the word snake, which is close in sound to it. It meant a collective image of a huge number of lizard-like and snake-like monsters. There are many dragons in Greek mythology. One of the most striking examples is Typhon, a hundred-headed giant dragon born to the snake goddess Gaia and the chaos god Tartarus. Typhon challenged the Olympian gods, but was defeated by Zeus. The Lord of Olympus placed a huge mountain on top of Typhon. Later, people associated earthquakes and eruptions in the area of that mountain with Typhon, who tries to get out and melt the rock with his flames. In Greek mythology, various dragon-like creatures were so common that they became associated with Greek culture. Already during the Middle Ages, tales of dragons erupted with full force, spreading across the continent with incredible speed. The main reason for this popularization of the dragon image was the Bible. In the Middle Ages, Christianity was considered the only possible way of life, 
precisely the way of life, not a religion. The Bible was the truth of the world of those times, and images from the Bible were passed on by word of mouth. It was in the Bible that one of the most recognizable monsters in history, Leviathan, appeared. A huge, multi-headed, winged, fire-breathing sea serpent, Leviathan became one of the main personifications of the dragon. Leviathan was an evil, unstoppable force, the embodiment of the cold, evil doom of the sea. The monster could kill with a simple glance, and its skin was impervious to conventional weapons. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scale are his pride, shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yeah, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reasons of breakings they purify themselves. The sword of him that laughed at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the haberdian. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He makes a path to shine after him, one would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things, he is a king over all the children of pride. Leviathan was a real fear in the flesh. He was so powerful that only God himself, who made the serpent, destroyed him, as recorded in the book of Isaiah. Since Leviathan was the only one of his kind, one of the few that God did not make a mate for, there were no such monsters left after him, according to the Bible. Another evil big lizard mentioned in the Bible was the red dragon of the apocalypse, a huge serpent with wings, seven heads, and ten horns. It was from biblical descriptions that the common dragons emerged, which later began to appear in legends throughout Europe. The Anglo-Saxonic hero Beowulf, for example, does battle with a huge dragon that terrorizes the villages of the Goths. The dragon burns down houses and eats livestock because people have trespassed on his hoard of jewelry. This is one of the first references to dragon's attachment to gold and jewelry. Beowulf finds the dragon and defeats it in battle, but in the course of the battle the hero himself is mortally wounded. This event is described as a fitting end for the great hero. Beowulf's body, along with the dragon's treasure, is burned on the same funeral pyre. In Germanic and Scandinavian peoples, the dragon is called by the word worm serpent, that is. A lot of epics revolve around the image of the evil lizard. One of the most memorable characters is the dragon Fafnir, the image of which is well spread among the Germans and Scandinavians. According to the legend, Fafnir is the son of the sorcerer Hreidmar. He had two brothers, Otter and Regin, and Fafnir was the largest and strongest of them. Each of Hreidmar's sons could take the form of beasts. Their father taught them to do so, one day, the middle brother Otter was swimming in the waterfall in the form of an otter. After catching a salmon fish, he swam ashore and began to eat it. At that time, the Aesir were walking along the shore, Loki, Odin and Hjolnir. Loki noticed the otter and killed it by throwing a stone exactly at the animal's temple. He did not know that in the form of the otter there was a living man and even the son of a sorcerer. The Aesir god began to boast that with one stone he was able to get both the otter and the salmon, and that now he had a good dinner. He skinned the otter and moved on. Before nightfall, they found Hreidmar's hut 
and asked the sorcerer for a night's lodging. The sorcerer agreed, and in the evening the Aesir found themselves in the company of the sorcerer and his sons. Hrydmar was worried about where his third son had gone. Loki, having an otter and a salmon, started bragging about how skillfully he had killed the animal, what a good hide it had, and offered to cook the meat. In the dead otter, Hrydmar and his sons saw the missing otter. Now he was dead and without skin. They took the Aesir gods prisoners and bound them. To get the sorcerer and his sons to let them go, the Aesir offered them in payment as much gold as Hrydmar himself would give them. The sorcerer took the skin of his son, who had been killed as an otter, and said that he would let the Aesir gods go only when they had completely filled it with gold and put some more gold on top of it. The Aesir did not have that much gold, so they sent Loki to get enough of the precious metal, while they themselves remained as hostages. Loki managed to find the gold from the dwarf Andvari in the land of the Black Elves. The angry dwarf gave up everything except the gold ring, which could multiply his wealth again. And when Loki demanded this ring from Andvari, the dwarf cried out, Now shall the gold that Gust once had bring death to brothers twain, and evil be for heroes eight. Joy of my wealth shall no man win. The dwarf cursed the ring, but Loki did not pay much attention to that curse. He brought the gold to the sorcerer, stuffed the whole skin of his murdered son with it, and covered it with his gold on top. The ring he brought was very much to Odin's liking. He wanted to take it for himself, but the sorcerer Hrydmar noticed that his son Otter's skin was not completely covered with gold, and that Otter's whisker was sticking out of the heap, and it should have been covered as well. Odin let out a sigh, and with this ring he covered Otter's protruding whisker. After that, the sorcerer let the Aesir go. Loki told him that the ring was cursed, but the sorcerer did not pay attention to the warning. Immediately after the Aesir left, Hrydmar's two remaining sons, Fafnir and Regin, demanded from their father a share of the pile of gold. But Hrydmar had already fallen under the curse of the ring and refused to share his wealth. The sons began to envy their father. At night, Fafnir, the eldest of the brothers and the strongest of them, killed his sorcerer father and took his gold, along with his brother's skin and the cursed ring. Regin, who saw this, demanded his half of the gold from Fafnir, but he would not share. The two brothers fought, and Fafnir killed Regin. Then, enchanted by the ring, Fafnir took all the gold, went to the Dnitaheide field, took the form of a huge dragon, and rested on that gold, cherishing it. After the story, I think you guys will look at The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings by John Tolkien a little differently and understand where he got the inspiration for his dragon smog and the ring of power. Thus, we see that the image of the dragon Fafnir originated in Scandinavia, but it gained special popularity in the Germanic epic. So, after all the events with the Aesir, the dragon Fafnir, resting on the gold of the Aesir and the remnants of his own brother's skin, was found by the legendary dragon slayer Siegfried. He killed the dragon and took his treasure, though before his death, Fafnir warned Siegfried that the treasure would be his curse. Thus began the incredible Nibelungenlied. Dragons in Asia So far, we have spoken of the most important for the world culture images of dragons in the mythology of European peoples, but it would be a real crime not to mention in this story the dragons of Asian and Eastern mythology. For if in Western mythology the dragon was a creature mainly evil, dangerous, destructive and deadly, in the East, dragons were considered divine beings, personifying the forces of nature. Thus, they differed from their Western relatives, both in appearance and in essence. They were called by different names. In China, Long. In Japan, Ryu. In Korea, Yong. In Vietnam, Long. They were depicted as huge weird snakes. Their body was elongated, Wings were absent, with rare exceptions. On the head there were antlers, a mane, whiskers, skin covered with fish scales. The number of legs was the same, four. Only the number of toes differed in different cultures. The eastern dragon often had some rounded object in its paws. Somewhere it is said to be a pearl, giving him, the dragon, power over the weather. Somewhere else it is said that it was just a dragon's egg. Chinese dragons were divided into a huge number of species that differed in colors and powers and were responsible for different natural beginnings. From Tianlong, the heavenly dragon, the guardian who guards the heavenly halls and protects the gods, to Xuanlong, the black or hidden dragon who lives in the depths of the mystical waters. We could try to list them for a very long time. There are dragons in all colors of the rainbow, 
which are responsible for different natural processes or spiritual symbols. And taking into account that different peoples of Asia had even more of these dragons, and they are different, this story could drag on for another hour. We will not name them all, instead noting that in the mythology of the peoples of Asia, dragons are remembered centuries before our era. The ruler over these creatures has always been Long Wang, King of Dragons. He was called the master of the water element, and his size reached 500 meters in length. In any case, the image of the dragon became an integral part of the world culture, spread with incredible speed and got fueled by new and new legends and tales. Up to our days it has reached, having absorbed features of both western and eastern dragons, also supplemented by new legends and tales, all mixed. Thus, eastern dragons have acquired wings, European, mane and beard. Some dragons have six legs, some of them have gone away from the fire or natural beginning, becoming dragons of ice, venom, desert and so on. Now it is impossible to imagine almost any fantasy world without dragons. These creatures have captivated the minds and imaginations of a great many talented people of our world. Some people still believe that dragons actually exist. Try to remember at least the monster of Loch Ness. They are firmly planted in cinema, literature, music and all other forms of modern art. And of course, video games could not do without them. Once again, you can list video games with dragons going to infinity and even further, but we are here for the sake of one universe. After all, in his time, the Polish writer Andrzej Sapkowski told about dragons in the cycle of books about the Witcher. And today, the video game expanded world of the Witcher cannot even be imagined without dragons. They are diverse, complex and beautiful. They are among the oldest and most interesting creatures of the Witcher universe. The Dragons of the Witcher's World The bestiary entry reads, Once dragons were commonplace and ruled the continent absolutely, dragon fire was the bane of cities and dragon appetite was a constant threat to the first colonizers. Sorcerers stood against these creatures. Witchers were created to fight them. Today dragons are nearly extinct. Sometimes forktails and slizzards can be seen but compared to dragons, they are like stray cats to tigers. The beasts were exterminated by professional hunters, such as the famed Crinford Reavers. Alchemical components found in a dragon's body are among the most expensive on the market and are in high demand among sorcerers. The beast's roasted tail is a real delicacy. Dragons are among the first inhabitants of the continent. In the history of the Witcher World issues, we told you about how the first colonizers fought dragons, how the first wizards, led by Ian Becker, Eva Richet, Geoffrey Monk and Jean Battista went up against dragons to settle new territories. The dragons were pushed farther and farther south and east, so there were fewer and fewer of them left in the inhabited part of the continent. Eventually, Cosimo Malaspina and Alzer of Maribor created the first witchers, and from that time on, dragons had no place in the populated world. Nevertheless, legends and tales of dragons persist among humans to this day. Yes, and from time to time, every now and then, a rumor slips that someone saw somewhere a winged monster again. Scientists investigated these creatures with special zeal. For their scales, blood and bones had amazing properties that could not be achieved by any alchemical research. Dragons are huge, scaled-covered reptiles with four limbs and broad, non-topped wings. They have long, slender necks and narrow, triangular heads, as well as split tongues. Some individuals also have bony outgrowths of horns on their heads and or along their spines. They are the largest members of the Draconid order, which because of their visual similarity and distant kinship to dragons includes monsters such as Basilisk, Wyvern, Vigilazor, Forktail, Sea Serpent and Slizzard. Dragons are extremely long-lived, living for thousands of years. They have incredible regeneration and can absorb magic from nature. These lizards are extremely intelligent, can speak various languages, and some of them can even take on human form. Most of them, however, do not care about coins and expensive gems, but about their offsprings instead, which they have very rarely. Only the female dragon cares about the egg. The male mostly does not bother himself with his burden. After the young dragon hatches, the female stays with him for some time, after which she prefers to leave the young dragon alone. After that, it has to survive on its own. Dragons are classified by color. There are white, green, gold, red, black and rock dragons. White dragons dwell in the far north, and have only been seen in cover and pavis. It is reported that there are few of them left, and in recent years, tales of these dragons have been brought only by adventurers traveling in the Dragon Mountains and the frozen northern wastelands. The average size of a white dragon is known to be 10 meters in length, 
and in its arsenal it possesses a unique ice breath that freezes everything in its path. Green dragons are the most common subspecies, which still even maintains some numbers. Their scales can have a bright green or grayish tint. When it has a gray tint, from afar the monster may even resemble a white dragon. However, the closer you get to the dragon, the more greenish color the scales of its skin give off. Green dragons reach no more than 5 meters in length, spit poison and emit poisonous fumes, making it very dangerous to even just approach them. The most famous members of the green dragon species are Merctabrache and Seisentesis. The latter is a hybrid of a golden and green dragon. The daughter of Merctabrache and villain Tretenmerth, also recalled in the game series, is a green dragon that was once slain by the witcher George of Kagan. The dragon was strong and although the legendary monster hunter was able to defeat it, the beast inflicted a fatal wound on George before he died. The book saga also mentions the legendary dragon Akvist, who once lived on Quartz Mountain. He was killed by Yarpen Zigrin and his squad of dwarves. Yarpen tells Geralt of Rivia that in his cave the dragon kept untold treasures, including sapphires of unprecedented colors and diamonds the size of cherries. As for golden dragons, their species is the most legendary and surrounded by myths. Their scales shimmer with the beautiful color of gold and each golden dragon can take on a human form. They are graceful, feline-like lizards, covered from their long tails to their triangular heads with shiny golden scales in a particular pattern. Their eyes have vertical pupils. Their wide, unthrusting wings are also golden. They have a series of triangular serrated outgrowths along their spines from neck to tail. They are not the largest of their kin, but they are definitely the smartest and fastest. Their reflexes work perfectly and their fiery breath is a real terror to foes. It is worth noting that all over the continent, golden dragons are considered a fiction. No one had ever seen a golden dragon, and anyone who claimed otherwise would be laughed at in an instant. Even the witchers considered golden dragons to be nothing more than a myth. In the books of the Witcher series, however, it is the golden dragon that is described in details. Geralt of Rivia meets him. His name is Villain Tretenmerth. In the game series, the witcher meets Seisentesis, a dragon that has the feature of both the golden and green species, for she is the daughter of the golden and green dragons, Merkta Brake and Villain Tretenmerth. Red dragons are among the largest and most powerful of their brethren. They reach 15-20 meters in length, breathe green flames and their fire is so strong that it can melt any metal. From nose to tail, the dragon's neck and back are dotted with sharp, cone-shaped horns. The scales are brick or red in hue becoming more intense in color the longer the dragon lives. Red dragons are incredibly rare, and one of the most recent, if not the last of them, is Keltullis, a female red dragon living in the Mahakam Mountains. Interesting, although red dragons are considered incredibly rare, the Crinford Reavers boast in the pages of the book saga that they have killed at least three of them. Keltullis, on the other hand, lives in peace with the Mahakam dwarves for the time being. The dwarf clans who have been at war with it for a long time and for a long time believed that Keltullus was a male, came to the conclusion about 300 years ago that it would be easier to make an agreement with the intelligent beast. They would supply it with golden provisions, and in exchange it would not burn their houses or devour them. This arrangement was broken, however, when the dwarves got tired of paying the dragon with provisions, so they slipped her some poisoned meat. The dragon female lost her offspring because of them, became angry and began to wreak havoc on the dwarves who had broken the agreement. The fate of Keltullus depends on Queen Maeve of Lyria, who during the Thronebreaker game can either spare the dragon or kill her. The last two types of dragons are black and rock dragons. There is almost no information about each of them. Black dragons are the largest of their kin. They live in swamps and spit acid, which burns through even the strongest armor very easily. Rock dragons resemble their black counterparts in the color of their scales, but they are much smaller, often not reaching 5 meters in length. All that is known about rock dragons is that they are either completely extinct or on the verge of extinction. They can't use their poisonous spit in battles, so they fight their enemies with the usual methods – tail, claws and teeth. In the story A Grain of Truth, there is information that the grandfather of the cursed Nivellen once killed a rock dragon. Dragons are viewed differently by different sentient beings, but according to villain Tretenmerth, the vast majority of dragons themselves have some kind of instinctive, irrational aversion to humans. Because of this, the first human colonists once fade so much aggression from the dragons. Humans themselves have different attitudes towards dragons. The Nordlings fear and loathe dragons, for they have no idea how to oppose them. Nevertheless, they honor the strength and grace of dragons, 
often placing their images on clan crests and flags. In Zerikania, for example, dragons are worshipped as deities. People bring gifts to the lizards and live under their blessings. Dragon hunting is most often provoked not by the usual need for self-preservation. People kill dragons for the gold they guard, to get their treasures, or to use fragments of their dead bodies for alchemical and magical experiments. Of course, the most significant dragon in the literary saga is Borg Three Jackdaws, or Villain Trettenmerth. In the guise of a man, he is in the company of two Zerikanian women and meets the Witcher Geralt of Rivia. Together, they arrive in the city and go to the pensive dragon tavern, where Borg asks the Witcher about his attitude to dragons, finding out that Geralt does not hunt them. The Witcher finds common ground with his new companions. Borg, Geralt and the Zerikanian women spend the night in the same tub of hot water and leave for Hankforce in the morning. At the crossing of the river Bra, Geralt, Borg and the Zerikanian women learn that an amazing wagon has gathered on the other side of the river. King Nedimir is in command and with him in the wagon are the famous monster hunters, the knight Aegob Denisley, the dwarves led by Yarp and Zygrin, and the Crimford Reavers. Also on their team is the sorceress Yennefer of Vengeberg. Rumor has it that the king has decided to hunt the green dragon and that is why he has assembled such an amazing team. Geralt, having heard about Yennefer, tries to get to the other side of the river by all means. Borg and the sorcerer Doregori of Vol help him in this matter. Borg Three Jackdaws acts according to his own plan. No one knows that he is actually a dragon, so Borg learns everything he needed in the camp of King Nidimir, after which the next day he brings down a rockfall on the wagon of adventurers on the way and disappears with the Zerikanian women. Everyone thinks that he is dead, but they get out of the deadly danger and with the rest of the wagon move on to the lair of the green dragon. We saved but one wagon from the entire caravan, your majesty, Gillenstern said. Not counting the reaver's wagon, seven bowmen remain from the troop. There's no longer a road on the far side of the chasm, just scree and a smooth wall, as far as the breach permits one to look. We know not if anyone survived of those who remained when the bridge collapsed. The remnants of King Nedimir's wagon are met with terrible news. There's a dragon in the gorge ahead, not a green one, a golden one, a true golden dragon from ancient legends. Because of this news, a riot breaks out in the king's caravan. No one listens to Nedimir anymore. Both the Krimfid Reavers and Yarp and Zygrim's boys have come here for their own purposes. It was the Reavers, however, who were the quickest ones to recover. They seized and bound Geralt, Yennefer, Doregori and Dandelion, the villagers of Bearfield, a neighboring village that was suffering from dragon attacks gathered around the wagon. But villain Trittenmirth got tired of waiting for those who have come to hunt him, so he turned to the hunters himself. The golden dragon on the hill yawned, lifted its head, waved its wings and lashed the ground with its tail. King Nedimir and you, knights! It yelled with a roar like a brass trumpet. I am the dragon villain Trittenmirth. As I see, the landslide which I, though I say it as shouldn't, sent down on your heads did not completely stop you. You have come this far. As you know, there are only three ways out of this valley, east toward Bearfield and west towards Cairngorm, and you may use those roads. You will not take the northern gorge, gentlemen, because I, Villain Trettenmerth, forbid you. However, if anyone does not wish to respect my injunction, I challenge him to fight an honorable knightly duel with conventional weapons, without spells, without breathing fire, a fight to the utter capitulation of one of the sides. I await an answer through your herald, as custom dictates. The first to speak was the proud knight Ake of Denisley. He thought it was a dragon slayer, but in a few moments Villain Trettenmerth playfully tackled the knight and crippled him severely. Next, the dragon swiftly dispersed the Crimfid Reavers and scared the dwarves to death. Only the villagers of Bearfield were able to find a moment and envelop the dragon with nets, so that the dragon was forced to call on the Zerikanian women for help. During this fuss, only the bound Geralt of Rivia, Yennefer of Vengeberg, Dandelion and Doregori of Vol remained unharmed from King Nedimir's wagon. Geralt was able to help Yennefer free herself and the sorceress quickly scattered the villagers with her spells, thus helping villain Trettenmerth to free himself. After the villagers had run away, the dragon regained its human form and everyone saw that it was Borg Three Jackdaws. Together, the Witcher and the Sorceress talk to Borg, who tells them that the dragoness Merktabrake called him to protect her child from humans and flew away. He mentions that sometimes dragons need their own Witchers when they can't handle threats on their own. That is right, the dragon interrupted. Well, it's the times we live in. For some time, 
Creatures, which he usually call monsters, have been feeling more and more under threat from people. They can no longer cope by themselves. They need a defender, some kind of witcher. The whelp was alive. The threats have been eliminated. No more dragons would be hunted in these parts. Villain Tretonmirth thanked Geralt and Yennefer. The future of his kind was in his hands. A little dragon child he would name Sassin Tessis. She would grow up and she too would be able to turn into a human and Geralt of Rivia would meet her again. That's all for today. Put a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to the channel. Click on the bell to not miss any of our videos on the Witch universe on the channel. Write about what the author may have gotten wrong, what you don't understand or which dragons are your favorite. We'd appreciate if you supported our work on Patreon or with a direct sponsored subscription here on YouTube. That way you can participate in choosing topics for our videos and get early access to them. But anyways, thank you all for watching and see you soon when the old witcher speaks once more.